So I just really want to start by really thanking Rachel, the SSI, the whole CW20 team for such an amazing job, uh, putting everything together uh, in, uh, in just a matter of weeks. Um, and it's just uh, amazing what you're, all, what you're all doing given the current circumstances. Uh, I want to thank you also for asking me to speak today about open research. What I've decided to do is to talk about open research in the context of what's happened in my discipline, which is psychology, over the last decade or so. Uh, and in a sense, psychology has acted as a little bit of the canary in the coal mine, um, which has kind of raised uh, you know, a number of questions about how we do science, really. So first of all, um, what I want you to do, I'm going to take you back in time. So I want you to jump aboard my time machine. Okay, so we're going to jump back about uh, nine or ten years or so to the year 2011. What happened in 2011 was that scientists uh, apparently uh, found evidence of extrasensory perception. And you might remember this uh, being reported, uh, not surprisingly, most of the world's newspapers picked up on this, uh, you know, absolutely remarkable discovery. It was all due to um, research um, conducted by a chap called Daryl Bem that came out in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. And this paper contained a number of studies which seemed to indicate that people's behavior at a point in time could be influenced by something that hadn't happened yet, okay? He used standard techniques in experimental psychology and showed that events that hadn't occurred affected people's behavior now. And this, you know, is a respectable journal. It's a very well-respected scientist. Uh, Daryl Bem had a long and distinguished track record. Uh, JPSP, the journal, came out, is uh, the, one of the top journals uh, in this area. Um, it went through standard peer review and he uses, used standard statistical and scientific and uh, methods. But, you know, obviously it raised a number of questions uh, and quite reasonably people concluded that what it really meant wasn't that ESP is real, what it meant was that science is broken. Uh, this caused a lot of concern within the psychology community. Researchers began to think, well, you know, if this research is wrong, what else out there might be wrong? Sims and all reported work then showing that by uh, using standard ways of analyzing data, dropping participants, uh, excluding problematical, problematic data points, reporting selective analyses, um, really ultimately results in a inflated false positive, okay? That basically means that uh, people are publishing research that's wrong. So all of these kind of um, uh, methods together became known as p-hacking. And it really raised the question is how big a problem is this for psychology in particular, and might it even apply outside of psychology? So the open science framework was established by Brian Nusek. Uh, it ultimately resulted in the Center for Open Science as a way of determining how much of the literature might actually be wrong and coming up with a set of uh, guidelines that improve how we conduct research in the future. You might recognize these three people uh, standing in a rather unusual manner. If you're of a similar age to me, the first thing you probably think of when you see these images is Blackadder, uh, the Prince Regent there, played by Hugh Loring. So those politicians uh, and these three characters here um, are adopting what's known as a power pose. So power posing uh, was first described in an article that came out in 2010 by Dana Carney, Amy Cuddy, and Andy App. And what it showed, or what it claimed to show, was it standing in a way that kind of expressed power in this sort of manner, 
didn't just make people feel more powerful, it also raised their testosterone levels and ultimately made them more powerful. So this you know, had massive impact um, on the literature. It was picked up by media organizations, lots of consultancies uh, out there went and spoke to organizations, businesses, politicians, and basically told them how to stand in order to be more powerful. Um, again, this is another one of those studies where people then started to worry, what if this is just wrong? This is a great journal, it's like science, you know, it's a very top tier journal, but what if this research is actually wrong? So Brian Nusek, as part of the Open Science Foundation and the Center for Open Science, set up a global team of researchers who basically went out to try and replicate 100 experiments that appeared in high profile psychology journals, Psychological Science, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, and Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning, Memory and Cognition. And these three journals are the kind of journals where as a psychologist, if you publish in them, you think, you know, that's a, that's a career publication. That's an important publication to have. And what they actually found was out of these 100 experiments, the majority did not replicate. 61 of these experiments that were conducted reasonably using standard methods, went through peer review and came out in top journals, didn't actually replicate. And those that did replicate, it tended to be the case that the effect sizes, so the magnitude of the effect in the replications was much smaller than the magnitude of the effect in the original journal article. So the replication crisis now, as it became known, became a very big media story. This is an article from The Guardian comparing power posing in 2010 and power posing in 2016. In 2010, power posing, it was very big. If you act powerfully, you will begin to think powerfully. That's in 2010. In 2016, interestingly, power posing didn't replicate, not surprisingly. And one of the original authors said, you know what? Actually, it was all nonsense. I do not believe that power pose effects are real. Standing like John Wayne in a gunfight does not make you feel like a successful gunslinger. It just makes you look silly, okay? So power posing was really uh, probably the biggest thing then that brought the so-called replication crisis into the media. And many other effects then didn't replicate either. Ego depletion, social priming, learning styles, Stanford Prison Experiment, growth mindset, all of these either didn't replicate or were discovered to have much smaller effects of magnitude than had originally been suggested. And it turns out none of this is new. We've known about the problems in how we conduct research for you know, at least 50 years. Paul Meal in 1967 was arguably the sort of first high profile uh, researcher to actually really kind of highlight the methodological problems that are inherent in how many research disciplines function. Uh, 30 odd years ago, Doug Altman basically said, the system encourages poor research and it is the system that should be changed. We need less research, better research, and research done for the right reasons. Abandoning the number of publications as a measure of ability would be a good start. Um, Norbert Kerr, just over 20 years ago, talked about harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. This is what happens when you conduct an experiment. The, ex the results don't pan out as you expect it, so you kind of scratch your head and think, oh, okay, what's the story behind this? And then you come up with a very plausible explanation as to what might be behind your results. But this wasn't you know, done a priori. You didn't predict these results. You're basically making sense of them after they've come about. And ultimately, what you're probably doing in many cases is mining noise. Uh, the most recent academic really to sort of kickstart this whole conversation, John Ioannidis, in 2005 published an article which said that most published research findings are false. And what's going on is it really scientists, good scientists, scientists with the best intentions have been engaging in what are known as questionable research practices, which arguably are driven by an incentive structure that actually doesn't incentivize doing good science. Uh, Marcus Manafu, Dorothy Bishop and colleagues published this article just a few years ago in Nature Human Behaviour, basically describing the way in which experimental work is conducted and talking about all the stages in that experimental research cycle where problems creep in that ultimately raise the false positive rate and ultimately lead to a research literature that contains findings that aren't real. Some of the most important ones are low statistical power, 
and p-hacking, publication bias too. So the basic issue is that there are too many studies with experimental power that is too low to detect the effect size that they're looking for. One of the consequences of low powered studies is that when real effects are detected, the effect size is likely to be overestimated. There's a file drawer problem. Studies that don't find, in quotes, significant results don't get published. Other people don't know about them. And if you're basing your research on effect sizes in the published literature, and if those effect sizes are overestimates, overestimates are inflated, then your research is by definition going to be underpowered. And what I worry about is seeing PhD students for their first experiment in their PhD conducting a study that's trying to replicate a well-established effect, failing to find that effect, and assuming that Sam, that's a problem, they're bad scientists, whereas actually the effect was never there in the first place. So there's, there's a real issue there in terms of the kind of um, impact of questionable research practices on science and people's careers. Psychology is a canary in the coal mine because it turns out this isn't a problem just for psychology. This is a problem across a whole range of biomedical sciences. Kate Button and colleagues uh, analyze the average or the median power rating the median power of experiments in different biomedical sciences for finding effects, assuming the effects are there to be found. Psychology is going to find effect sizes, effects about 50% of the time. Genetic research, their experiments are woefully underpowered. Only 11% of the time are they going to find effects, even though the effects are there to be found. This is a massive waste of time and money. Dorothy Bishop uh, last year published a really nice, let so Dorothy Bishop is really at the forefront of discussions around reproducibility and what we can do about it in terms of adopting open research practices. It's well worth reading this article. Uh, this sentence here captures everything as far as I'm concerned. Many researchers persist in working in a way almost guaranteed not to deliver meaningful results, okay? So something is fundamentally broken. It got to the point that the American Statistical Association had to actually release a statement telling scientists what p-values are and what p-values aren't, okay? So researchers who are using null hypothesis significance testing, turns out, didn't really understand what it was they were doing. If you ask your average academic who's not a statistician, who's not a biostatistician, to define a p-value, they'll basically get it wrong. So the ASI had to come out and basically explain what they are and what they aren't. And it's kind of shocking that, you know, people with millions of pounds worth of research income were basically doing research, uh, but they didn't really understand the statistical procedures they were applying to their research or the possibility or, or likelihood rather that questionable research practices were resulting in them mining noise. So this leads us on to the question, how do we make our research more reproducible? So in response to the uh, reproducibility crisis, uh, the UKRN came together just over a year or so ago, established by uh, Marcus Bonafo at the University of Bristol. The goal of the UKRN is basically to improve research quality within the UK initially, but hopefully to have a broader impact. What I like about the UKRN is that it came about over Twitter. Marcus Monafo uh, sent a few tweets out asking people who are already having conversations around open research and reproducibility if they'd be interested in setting up a local network at their home university. And what's nice about that, because it came about in this sort of, you know, you know, social media world, it was very much a grassroots initiative. You know, so thankfully, it wasn't the case that universities decided to do this in a top-down way, because when universities decide to do things in a top-down way, they tend not to work, okay? So the UKRN, very much grassroots-led, coordinating um, people at different universities within the UK. Um, I said it's a peer-led consortium. It's all about improving best practice. Mark Monafu at Bristol, uh, sort of founded the UKRN alongside uh, Malcolm McLeod at Edinburgh, Laura Fortunato at um, Oxford, uh, Alexandra Collins at Imperial, and Chris Chambers at Cardiff. And some of these people I suspect you may know already. The UKRN has had a lot of support from uh, 
a range of stakeholders within the UK and it's fantastic to read recently and uh, chatting with Neil a few weeks ago, the SSI are now one of the UKRM's stakeholders. Pretty much all of the research councils within the UK are uh, funding the UKRM, uh, CRUK, UKRI, Research England, Welcome, uh, JISC, so there's a whole range of stakeholders across the board who are recognising what the UKRN are trying to do in terms of encouraging researchers to adopt open research practices is a good thing. It's a good thing for science and it's a good thing for the funders because actually it's going to mean that the money is probably going to be more effectively spent. As part of the UKRN, there are a number of uh, smaller organisations that kind of fit within the UKR umbrella. You might have come across the Reproducibility Initiative. It's a journal club initiative uh, started in Oxford in 2018 that is a chance for uh, young researchers, early career researchers, to come together uh, and talk about issues related to open research and reproducibility uh, in their local environment. Um, what's nice about the Reproducibility Network is it's really grown massively over the last couple of years. It's now spread to 81 institutions in 22 different countries. And here they are plotted all over the world. Uh, one of my mentees in Montreal is just starting a uh, Canadian uh, Reproducibility Club at, uh, at his university. Um, so there are a number of early career researchers involved in running the repro -T clubs. Uh, Amy Orban, Sam Parsons uh, are probably the ones who you might have come across um, as they're. Uh, they also run the podcast involving other repro -T members too, including Jip Pickering from the University of Manchester, who is focused on community building and merchandising. Also in the context of the UKRN, there are a number of open research working groups that have been set up all across the UK. Um, there are, in addition to the grassroots-led open research working groups, institutions are now buying into the UKRN. This has just happened over the last few months or so. You can kind of see a number of key institutions, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Newcastle, Sheffield, Keele, Bristol, Oxford, Brooks, Reading, Surrey, UCL. Um, have all joined the UKRN as academic partners where they will be promoting the adoption of open research practices internally, uh, making sure that open research practices are embedded within the local community. In addition to the institutional groups, there are a number of open research working groups. These are the grassroots um, kind of skunk works uh, level groups that exist over the UK. There are now close to 60 of these uh, and they're very much separate from what's happening at an institutional level. So these are clearly activist-led research groups and the focus is very much uh, on how we do better research and how we teach and educate others in order to do better research through the adoption of open research practices. I'm going to briefly mention the Manchester group. It was established in 2018 by myself, Caroline Jay, Jade Pickering, Thomas Richardson and Will, Will Hume. We all kind of responded to, uh, to Marcus's uh, initial tweets. We meet quarterly and we've got a mailing list of about 140 subscribers. Um, I attend the annual UKRN meetings, there was one a few weeks ago in Oxford, um, and I also sit on the university level open research strategy group at Manchester, basically uh, ensuring that the voice of the grassroots community is heard um, at the top table at the university and to try and influence things where I can. We're well connected as a group with the Carpentries. Uh, several members uh, are Carpentry certified instructors. There's nice overlap, not surprisingly, between our Open Research Working Group and the R Users Group at Manchester. Uh, members of the Open Research Working Group are also active in regular meetings of the R Ladies Group and the Her Plus Data Meetup Group organised by Rachel. Um, Dermot, my colleague at Lancaster, put this handy infographic together which tells us where North is and where not North is. Um, we've actually created a Northwest hub of open research groups, uh, bringing together uh, Lancaster, Keel, Chester, Sheffield, MMU, um, to try and kind of form a sort of Northwest regional centre uh, for um, open research discussions. The latest activity of the UKRN looks as if it's going to be centred around trying to get some Research England Development Fund money to help support these local hubs, which will be led by institutions who are academic stakeholders, 
of the UKRN, um, unfortunately not Manchester at this point. Just about a month or so ago, uh, although to be honest, it feels like you know a decade or so ago, we had an event at Manchester at the end of February where we brought together a number of local open research working groups to uh, share best practice, to talk about issues related to open research. It was co-sponsored by the SSI and the UKRN, held at the University of Manchester. Um, and I know some of the attendees today were at this meeting with a fantastic range of talks. Some names will be familiar, with, uh, familiar to you. We heard from Dermot talking about the UKRN, Rachel talking about the SSI. Um, David Eisner had a great talk about whether or not the, scientific, the system currently rewards scientific fraudsters. And then we had another fantastic talk from Carol Goebel, all about wrangling uh, open science policy. Dorothy Bishop gave a phenomenal keynote talk. So it was a really nice chance for about 80 uh, members of the Northwest Open Research Working Groups to get together. And I think this is what's key. It's all about connecting communities. There are a number of communities that overlap nicely in terms of interests, but also in terms of people. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, uh, the amazing Cheering way, uh, Kirsty Whitaker, uh, Malvika Sharan, uh, doing a f and many others doing a phenomenal job of putting together this handbook for reproducible science. I've talked briefly about Repro T. We've got the amazing stuff that uh, Neil and everybody in the SSI are doing. Uh, the Open Life Sciences program, led by Malvika again, you and Bernice is doing a great job in terms of mentoring um, junior open. Uh, junior life science researchers, Carpentry is a very important organization for surplus data, Our Ladies, UKRN. So these organizations all overlap in terms of interests and in terms of people. Institutions need to step up to plate too. They need to change how they reward people, how they promote people, how they appoint people. And they're doing that. UCL, I think, were the first university to actually release a public statement on research expectations in terms of how they expect their researchers to engage in open research practices, uh, making the research software outputs and data open, using open access repositories, describing their data so that their data are fair, using GitHub and Zenodo. Um, talking about the statistics as well, pre-registering the studies before you do your research, you know, register an analysis plan, create simulated data if you can, build your modeling on the simulated data so you're not then having to kind of do anything sort of post hoc. Uh, publish null findings, let's get rid of this file drawer problem. You know, we need to know what effects are not, you know, cannot be found by other academics. We need to get those out there in the literature. Loughborough 2 have started to um, get on board with this too. They, had a, they were almost the second university to do this publicly. Loughborough have released a fantastic statement on open research. I'm going to finish just a couple of minutes. I want to talk a little bit about what's happening in terms of open research and COVID-19 that I've seen recently on Twitter. I'm sure you've seen it too. So we know that Neil Ferguson at Imperial uh, based his model, based his predictions on a model that was thousands of lines of undocumented C code from at least 13 years ago. It was initially developed to model flu pandemics. And not surprisingly, as soon as he tweeted that, a number of other people said, oh, crikey. It's a fundamental and problem science that we don't sufficiently value and fund software development. Usable, shareable, and well-documented never gets the time it needs. Why was this code not open access 13 years ago? Would it be if it was published today? I like this one down here. As a systems auditor, my stomach did a flip when I read thousands of lines of undocumented C. More discussion here. It makes you wonder why a critical piece of software to drive country strategy remains undocumented and unmaintained until the crisis arises. Well, that's because academic science is about papers. Everyone has to reinvent the wheel and write their own undocumented code. It is a failure of academic institutions and funding councils to recognize the need for maintenance of scientific software and manage it and fund it. Release the code now. Make an update in seven to 10 days. Community can make it reproducible and portable with Docker. Common workflow language wrappers. Not to mention the community can find and report errors. Uh, after the uh, Imperial study, Oxford then released another model. This chap up here, Tom Chiver, said the Oxford model basically made very different predictions and he applied his heuristic. If a scientific result is shocking, it's probably not true. What I thought was really interesting, and this kind of shows you the value of preprint servers, is that somebody said that the Oxford article that the Financial Times were reporting on appeared via Dropbox. 
not even bioarchive. So kind of already people are starting to be aware that the use of uh, preprint servers is actually really important as well, and at least in terms of opening things up, allowing other academics to come in. So I'm just going to finish off now. I've got a wee clock in front of me. I see the time's ticking down. We need to change. The academic incentive structure has to change. We need to focus less on people who are doing expensive science, and we need to reward people who are doing better science. REF could actually play a role in this. UA4, which is psychology, psychiatry, and neuroscience is actually explicitly rewarding open research now, asking for data and code to be made open, asking for pre-registration to be placed uh, to. Um, interestingly, one thing I've discovered is that many people don't even know what open research is across institutions. Many people just think it means making journal articles open. So there's a whole conversation we have to have around what open research is, and what it isn't. The critical thing, and this is my last slide, is that we really need to be teaching open research practices to our students. I talk to many academics, both at my career stage, more senior, more junior, they all say to me, I want to do open research, Andrew, but I don't know where to start. This is because there's a huge computational skills gap amongst not just our PhD students and postdocs, but also amongst our colleagues. And without these computational skills, people simply cannot adopt open and reproducible research practices. And I think that's our grand challenge. I think that is it. Okay, so I will stop sharing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. And what I should have done before you started was introduce you properly, so I apologize for that. But um, Andrew is a senior lecturer in the Division of Neuroscience and Experimental Psychology at the University of Manchester and did an amazing job talking about all of the things he's involved in, which is a lot. So thank yes. you so much, Andrew. Um, he's also been a huge help in organizing um, stuff for CW20. So you do have a few questions. Um, we probably don't have time for all of them, so okay. I'll let you answer them um in the docs in the note taking document um later but we can go ahead and, and ask you a few so could you comment more on the statistical power of the biological sciences um basically you need enough data to be able to do appropriate statistical analyses too many people are running experiments with not enough data points either not enough participants not enough samples and they end up Basically, when they apply statistical models or build statistical models left, right, and center, uh, they find effects that are really just false positives. They're not there to be found. I'm a great believer in doing data simulation before you actually collect real data. Data simulation will tell you whether or not your data set is going to be rich enough to support the sort of models that you want to build. So data simulation all the way is, is how we, I think we address that. The next question is, how has the effort to establish open research practices dealt with the different disciplines, aka it may be an issue in psychology, but it's not a problem here? So what's interesting is uh, I think at Manchester we've done a pretty good job of getting lots of different disciplines involved. And it's not necessarily the case that the replication problem looks the same in all disciplines, but different disciplines seem to have their same barriers in terms of adopting open research practices. And recently I had a few emails from people who are working in maths departments saying that their big concern is a lot of the models that they publish are never really tested properly, they're certainly not maintained, and they're rarely made open because there's no incentive, incentive to do so. So even if you're working in sort of theoretical domains, uh, making your modeling open is really, really important. So I think I'd struggle to see any, uh, imagine any discipline that doesn't have some form of, uh, of, of this at, as, as an issue. Um, there are quite a few more questions there. Uh, quickly, how should one go about establishing a local working group? <laughs> I, it's, all about, it's all about finding your tribe, in a sense, find those people that have common interests, maybe in terms of using open source software, maybe they're part of, part of coding groups you're already members of, people who've got similar sorts of interests. Uh, and then I think, I think the, real, the real change is going to come from the early career researchers. You know, it's PhD students who are really, you know, motivated to do good science, so make sure that the uh, early career research community is is on board right from right from the get go, and it's amazing what what our ECRs at Manchester have been able to do. Just okay. support support your colleagues, support your colleagues, and and amplify the voice of your early career research colleagues as well. I think it's hugely important. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, we're going to leave it there for now if you want to answer any of the other questions in the chat. But let's all give Andrew a huge round of applause. <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Um, so now we have a break um, just before